How'd you like the uh, musical number about Lawrence of Arabia? Uh, how did I like it? <laughs> when I saw that, when I said, here, here's Lawrence of Arabia, uh, I, I immediately wanted to punch you in the face. <laughs> I'm saying Borf connected Lawrence of Arabia, the film, arbitrarily because of that sentence. <laughs> Segway. I'm glad you asked this question. I'm that I sort of because... It's an interesting story, and uh, I think about it from time to time, and especially because people, it makes people kind of go, what? You know, what What was that? What, why is that in there? And I'm gonna tell you the background to why it's there. I don't know, maybe like 25 years ago when we first moved up from Toronto and we were uh, to where we are now, which is in Southern Georgian Bay, which is a snow belt. And so you got lots of cold weather, you got tons of snow. And I was freaked out when we first moved up here because I thought, what am I going to do with myself? You know, when the snows come, I don't know anybody. And we're, we're sort of... <laughs> just trapped um, inside in the cold, yeah. Tra I didn't know, like, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, am I going to have to, like, wear a, 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 a snowmobile suit all the time? Or what? <laughs> now, how do I get by? And who am I gonna? Who am I gonna get to? Who am I gonna meet? Like, because uh, my my wife was uh, articling as a, a criminal lawyer up here, and we just moved out of the city, and I, I didn't need to be anywhere particularly because, as a writer, you can just hit send, right, and then you're you're good. So, so we moved up, and uh, in a panic, I got the local newspaper, uh, and I opened it up, and I thought I'm gonna join the first thing that I see. <laughs> right, I'm going to join the freaking Moose Club or whatever it is, the Lions mm -hmm. Club. Or what it, I don't care what it is, and I'm going to walk in there, and I'm going to just belong, right? Yeah. That's my agenda. I'm just going to belong. Yeah, just, just make friends, join something, anything. Well, just join something, and I'm not going to go in. I'm going to go with my head down. I'm going to be modest. I'm not going to be the idiot city guy who just moved to town and is going to tell everybody how to do things. I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to just belong. I'm going to be among people. And so uh, the first thing I came on was a uh, audition for uh, a musicals, for a musical, uh, Oklahoma. Okay. So I thought, I'm going to, you know, I'll go audition. I'll sing my standard Elvis song and blah, blah. And if I, you know, get a job uh, as a coat check person or whatever, that's fine with me. I don't need to be any, you know. So I climbed over the snow, went to the library, which as it turns out was like a couple hundred meters down the road. I go in, I do my dumb Elvis song and I read a couple lines and I thought, well, okay. So I did, you know, I did, but you know, little old ladies, blue hair sitting at the mm -hmm. thing and they're all sort of this and that. And uh, it was kind of what you expect. I thought, great. Went home and they called me up and said, I'd got the lead. <laughs> okay, I had eight solos, eight songs I had to sing <laughs> in this giant hall and that mm -hmm. all the town would come. We'd do like seven shows and uh -huh. I like completely flipped out. And I thought, what have I done? <laughs> and I couldn't sleep, like I just couldn't sleep. Anyway, turned out it was fine and then I did my job and uh, you know, I, I, I experienced a bizarre kind of highly localized fame. So when I went to like the grocery store, there'd be I could hear them. That's Curly McLean from Oklahoma. <laughs> he, he buys vegetables too, just like everybody else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really weird. The next play was uh, The King and I, and I, I went in auditioned. And so I'm the king. Okay. And I got another nine solos. I've got 47 wives. I've got all this and I got all that. That's fine. I'm kind of I'm kind of a bit of a veteran now. I'll do it. That's fine. But they brought in this director from out of town, and the guy insisted that everybody get their skin bronzed. And wear yeah. this kind of like bizarre <laughs> Asian makeup. And, oh. and he kept using Mickey Rooney in Breakfast oh. at Tiffany's as a oh. good example. 
Okay, yeah. And I was just like, no, this is a this is where the kind of I just want to be long runs up against my <laughs> I don't want to do that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. And so I sort of I, I did I mean a lot of people just sort of jumped in and said, "Okay, great, give me the bronzer and like thing, uh-huh. and, you know, just the whole thing and the accent." And it was just, it was just horrifying. Uh, but as the king, so I kind of looked at Walter Brennan and I th- was it Walter Brennan, Yul Brenner, Yul Brenner. Why did Walter Brennan? Yul Yul Brenner. And so I was looking at him. Okay, this is what he did. That's what he did. So I I agreed to have a, like a little top knot. I thought that's fine. And and wearing uh, the sort of tie outfit, but I did not know. I'm not going to do any kind of an accent. I'm not going to bronze my skin. I'm not going to, you know, I'm just yeah. not going to do that. So and, and it's fine, you know. <laughs> so, but everybody, not everybody, but a number of them were really going to town on this, right? Yeah. And so then we had to do uh, a radio spot at a local radio station. So they brought us in, uh, <laughs> the cast, and of course the director and the stage manager made us all get up in our makeup and costumes and and the bronzered people with the eye and everything. And it was a radio. It was radio. <laughs> yeah, it was freaking it, ridiculous. Yeah, because they can hear the makeup. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, they sort of said it will sound. You'll sound better because you'll be aware that you're in character and stuff like that. Right? <laughs> And so I'm sitting in this radio station and they're interviewing us and there's this like these people dolled up in these really kind of racist outfit. Right. And 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 they're throwing in their lines and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, God, you know, <laughs> help me. But thankfully, it was radio. So the worst of it was kind of not included visually. Right? Yeah. And, and you know, it wasn't that I don't think anybody really believed that what they were doing was racist. Like, I, I don't think they thought that. I think they thought that this was just in line with showbiz and and and, you know, uh, yeah. getting it right or something. And so that it didn't really seem to factor. And, and, and w- when I did talk about it, it was sort of met with a kind of, huh? You know, <laughs> that was the kind of. Uh, thinking going gotcha. into the Lawrence and the Arabians. In fact, when when I first sort of wrote that in, this was a radio play, right? Originally, mm-hmm. it wasn't a film. So, I mean, it, 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 but when we got uh, to the film, I I did actually make it the King and I, and and it was I was really just doing exactly what happened, even the dialogue, the song, the thing, the duh. Uh, so it was going to be the King and I, and that was going to be a big joke. Uh, <clears throat> and then we couldn't do the King and I for obvious reasons. The right. And so I thought about yeah. what, 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 you know, well, well uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And uh, uh, I thought about the line, take no prisoners from Lawrence of Arabia and, and how that that's part of Grant Massey's shtick, right? Mm-hmm. So it was just sort of like put me there a little bit thinking about it. And then I read, uh, there's a great uh, uh, epic po- po- poem cycle uh, by Gwendolyn McEwen about uh, Lawrence of Arabia, which is fantastic. So I did a little bit of research and da da da. And then wrote this sort of song the night before, and uh, we all went down, and, and it was going to be done that way. Uh, so that it was a slight, it was a satire, really, of the. Uh, you know, sort of uh, ridiculously offensive innocence, right? <laughs> yeah. And it, something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, the song was fine. And the guy that stood beside me with the uh, little gun, he brought that prop in and he did that la 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 noise, which wasn't scripted at all. That was him improving. And I, I don't know if you see, but I give him a look. Like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> but yeah. I had already walked. I had already stepped in it at that point. So it's like, you know, yeah. okay, I mean, boy, I mean it, it played. And anyway. It played well. I think it was clear that, like, it was making fun of that. Um, it, for me, it was just no, like. this a, is the one thing I yeah. would say, though, Chris. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you in a sec. The one thing I would say, I wouldn't do that again. Like if I had to do that now, I wouldn't do that. 
Uh, and the reasons are pretty simple. One is, if you put people in brown face, black face, whatever you're doing to make fun of white people, you're actually making people very uncomfortable who are not white. And so you shouldn't do it. And that's sort of where I'm at with that now. I mean, I, I, I don't think the world is made any better by me satirizing this low hanging fruit, this easy target. And, and, and I, was, I became aware, uh, you know, that it, it, the joke will make uh, the people uncomfortable that you haven't included in the joke. Because the joke is about white people, two white people, by a white, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it creates this kind of thing. So I would not do it again that way. Uh, and, and, and I do have a, you know, it gives me a little cringe, an, a, a, a little cringe, uh, uh, <laughs> as it did when it originally, you know, in that radio mm -hmm. station as the king and I, <laughs> a major thing. Uh, oh, so man. that's really the story of that. There's one uh, other thing early on. Uh, a woman in Turkey who was the translator, because they do translations, and it was a translation. And she reached out to me through Facebook or something, which I thought was great, lovely. And we chatted and uh, still do every once in a while. And uh, she was all excited to be doing translations, and she was uh, texting me about, you know, what about this? Should I say that? How does this work? And that kind of thing. So it was kind of fun. Uh, and then she she finished it, and it had its sort of brief run in Turkey. And then she called, she she texted me back and said that that Lawrence in the Arabian scene is incredible incredibly popular with Turkish audiences who laughed their heads off and thought that it was, you know, this very incisive satire yeah. about, and then the song itself is sort of written in this kind of like ludicrous way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, I felt off the hook. I felt that she let me off the hook for a for 15 minutes or so, <laughs> but it still stands and I would not write that scene again. Like, well, I, that's the explanation. I, uh, I want to say thank you because, um, I, um, that is a scene where this is one of my favorite films. Um, well, thank you very much. I've watched it like 10, 15 times. It's one that my wife and I watch every Halloween. It's right up there with like the thing and, um, God bless uh, you. Thank the, you. The, the Wicker Man. We also watch the original Wicker Man all the time because love it's the Wicker Man. Love absolutely Wicker fantastic. Man. I love that one. Um, Bananas. But I want to say thank you because that is a scene that um, I've always wondered about it because you have two cameos that appear in the movie, and it's always been the one where I'm like, "This is very funny." It's also a little awkward, but it's it's uh, it's nice to hear that you are aware of that, and I can just kind of go back to oh, enjoying God, the film yeah. and being like, "Yeah." I guess uh, thank you for your time. I just wanted to like see if I could ask you a follow up on just the making yeah, of sure. the movie. Um, yeah, you sure. said that you guys kind of were planning on doing it as a film. I, I read another uh, interview you did. So you guys said you'd plan to doing it as a film, and then sort of just started doing it as a radio play. And then we're like, well, let's just bring in a camera and we can do a movie of this. And then it turned into the actual film. That's right. um, when you went into that was it uh sort of like putting together an album or what was the vibe on set was it something where it was like you know clearly defined where you were shooting or was it something where it was like anything that was like a loose written as you went type thing or anything like that uh well the, yeah the radio play, it was all sort of just sort of shoot shoehorned in and in between doing this and doing that and it was a kind of a hail mary because it was so hard to get the scripts that we had been right working on for like a decade we're not going to, everybody loved them, but there's, you know, you don't, we don't have that kind of money and la 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 la. So it, it became a real problem. And we just wanted to make the damn thing so that we could say we made it. And so uh, CBC, the radio, uh, national radio up here, had put out this call for, um, you know, pitches to make a hour long, I guess, radio dramas. And, uh, we threw a bunch, or Bruce threw a bunch in, and I, I threw in sort of, just kind of cooked it up on the spot. I thought, well, that's cool. Make a radio play and make it kind of War of the World Z, and, you know, that would be a lot of fun. So wrote really what was essentially the film. 
Uh, oh, okay. well, no, first sent the pitch in and they, they said no. <laughs> uh, they said it's too it's too dark and violent, and I think at the time there was some world events that were dark and violent, as there often is, and I can't remember what it was a war somewhere. But CBC was cautioning that we don't want to talk about these sort of charged, violent political things, and we just want to you know whatever, and so they didn't. Uh, go for it, but then a couple of months later, they I guess they had got all of their pitches in, and they sent they 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 reached out and said, actually, you know what, we think this is pretty good, so go ahead. So <clears throat> they threw us some money, and and we uh, hired uh, Steve McCaddy and and his wife Lisa Lisa Huell, and we kind of had the whole cast together, and we would just sit around and sort of like okay around a table right and do a bunch of different table reads we played and we laughed i was funny thought it was going to really work and yes we and we went into cbc and did it you know with sound effects guys mm -hmm. and the whole thing we didn't finish it though I and mean, we went to the cbc we only got half of it done and and while we were sort of waiting to schedule the second half of it Bruce kind of i guess was talking to someone who who was interested in investing uh, and and they said uh, they saw the script and said, "Yeah, let's go for that." And and you know, and we thought, well, we've got the cast, and they've actually been paid for, and we've got the script; it's been paid for. We have really pretty much what we need. And so we did. We without it being finished at the CBC, we went into the basement of this church and and built this set, this sort of limited set. So it's a low, mm -hmm. low budget thing, <laughs> and we got Bruce has pulled in some. Bruce has sort of. His favors come from an A-list pool, right? Because he's a he's he's a he's a he's a lion up here in Canada. Yeah, hardcore logo. <laughs> so all he that, yeah. so he brought all of that. Yeah. So he's brought in some good people, uh, Miroslav on uh, the DOP, and we've got some good people in C. McCaddy. And yes, there were certain things that we wanted to keep track of that created a kind of we didn't want to show uh, zombies. And we didn't want to leave the booth mm -hmm. uh, because the radio play, it, you don't even see anything. You just hear it. And so we wanted to stay as close to that. In fact, in the, in the early concept of it, it was just going to be Steve in the film. It was just going to be Steve McCaddy's face. And you would hear the voices of, of Laurel and of, of mm -hmm. Sidney Breyer. And you would just hear them. You wouldn't see anybody. You would just see his face. And the kind of thinking there, because McCaddy's got that incredible face, he's got that incredible voice, that if we could pull that off, then we've got a strong, we've got a strong story. And we've got, you know, if we can keep it riveting that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to rely on, on accounts, on stories, on the energy of of it and and you know where it goes uh, <clears throat> but you know once we brought on once the producers were in and, and people were sort of talking about it as a film everybody wants to open it up right everybody wants the frame to be bigger no we got to have the and we want to see sydney mm -hmm. and we want to see okay okay you know let's yeah, stay in the basement though producers are like yeah we need to see more of the uh, budget on screen we i get need it to see more we need to see more stuff and so, you know, we, we were very good at keeping the kind of uh, the, 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 the restrictions, you know, that we're not going to go outside of that. Uh, at one point, the producers panicked uh, and came in and said, look, this is we're making a goddamn zombie movie. And there's no zombies in this whole thing. <laughs> what are you guys doing? You know, and so uh, <laughs> they forced us, forced, but they, they, they threw it. A, p a bunch of money, money that w we didn't expect to see in this picture, but money to create a zombie scene, a uh, uh, you know zombie horde. And so we, Bruce and I went, okay, fine, you know, you pay uh -huh. for it, that's fine, we'll do it. So 
we put out a call for zombies. And of course, when you put out a call for zombies, extras, you get a bunch of 17, 18 year old stoners, right? Who just uh-huh. show up and, yeah. you know, and so <laughs> the whole parking lot is full of these guys. There's a couple hundred of them. So it just looks like a model Lord concert all of a sudden with a bunch of stoners oh, in the parking yeah. lot. And, so, and then we got those snow machines because it's June <laughs> and it's freaking hot. Snow machines, wind, zombie makeup, <laughs> everything's going on. It's, you know, there's, it looks like a rave, right? It's just uh-huh. ridiculous. And so we shot that all night long. It was all night long. And Bruce and I were on the roof watching this. And he turns to me and he says, you know how much of this we're going to use? And I said, not a frame. <laughs> Not a single frame. And we didn't. (laughs) But we knew while it was happening that we're doing this just to sort of make the Mother Corp happy, right, for a bit. Oh, my God. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's like having having read the book, it's like I can't imagine how you would shoot some of that stuff without like a big budget and someone just dedicated to makeup, like necks getting cracked and like people like disappearing into other people. It's well, like I that. know. I mean, in that sort of, there are a bunch of scripts uh, that have been written that are closer to the sort of events of the book and have the events of the book. Uh, but they're they're all suffering from the same problem, which is, I mean, part, one of the problems with Pontypool was it was not a popular film when it came out. And so, I mean, the thing, you know, the kind of model, I don't even know if they still use it, but they were persistent in it that opening box office will determine whether or not you can get a budget for a sequel or whether or not mm. there's interest. I mean, th- yeah. and, and so, you know, I think opening weekend, it, it made about four or five bucks and it didn't do much better than that yeah. for a long time. And, and you know, it got, it was stuck in a sort of suburban malls without any sort of fanfare about what it was about. So people invariably went in to see it and came out going, well, that was the fucking stupidest thing I've ever seen. You know, I have no idea what that <laughs> yeah, was they supposed just to be. Went in non so was- didn't know what it was. Yeah. They didn't know what it was. And so, you know, that's the way it sort of went for the first couple of years. And then it got, it, it sort of seemed to sort of gain some momentum word of mouth and showed up in different places and 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 now it's sort of earned earned its place earned its place and we're thinking sequels but <laughs> the sequels that are written and they're prequels and equals and sequels and all kinds of shit but they have an uphill battle because they're expensive um but i have a secret one i'm working on that i think well, I've talked to a couple of people because it's possible to make, and I think it's a truer sequel to the radio, and it's uh, a weather station uh, with a woman who's the weather the weather person, right? Uh-huh. And it's post kind of post Ponty Pool, where there are you know you have your weather with weather fronts, but you've also got kind of uh, news reports on. Uh, you know, by by labial plosives that are coming in uh, from the north <laughs> and to counteract <laughs> the antigen is yeah. to to whisper but yell any hard consonants and you'll probably be able to just get away with yeah. feeling lonely for a month but then you'll come back like it, it, it's a it's kind like, of yeah. so it's all semiotics still it's all like words all semiotics and, and it's yeah wow. and it, 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 so there are these storm fronts and these perverse oh, that's things rad. And, and antigens are all linguistic right and, yeah and, uh, anyway so i think it's a great idea and i'm working on it but uh that sounds see. awesome um like yeah, my, yeah. I mean, my favorite character from the book is uh, Ellen, because it was like one of the things that happens is I think she's the lady who has the stroke. So she has word yes. aphasia. So it's yeah. always fascinating to me because it seems like um, because she has word aphasia, she, of course, can't get the virus because she can't understand what people are saying. That's right. That's but then right. like uh, you I don't know if I was misreading it, but it always felt as though she was sort of interpreting the emotions behind what people were saying more than the words. So yes. she didn't pick up on the fact that her husband was like fully infected or anything was wrong until later. And there's yes. that scene in the pool where she's out in the water and all the zombies are around the edge and they're turning yes. towards her and they're saying things. And it's like, that's the point where the book sort of starts ripping apart reality a little bit for me. Cause yes, they're obviously yes. saying things. I don't know if what I'm 
reading in the book is actually uh, no, that's exactly a right. Real thing, yeah. That's exactly right. So that the the, the the descriptions that got you here are no longer describing here. They're doing something else, and and you yeah. can't really get around the other side of it and say, well, that this is what that is. No, you don't really mm -hmm. know. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a kind of a, a place I'm comfortable. Yeah, I loved I loved that part of the book because it seemed like the book got infected by the word virus as it went on. Oh, that's so, absolutely like, yeah. the case. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm glad that I read that correctly and didn't just assume. No, um, terrific. I'm glad you read the book. A lot of people put that book down after an afternoon with it. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I uh, I went through the whole book. I also read Hellmouths of Beudley. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I also have Cesara, which I haven't read yet. I think that's how you pronounce it because there's different... Cesarea, 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 Cesarea. Um, I'm going to send you... I got. Have you ever read The End Body Problem? No, I haven't yet. I'm going to send it to you. So afterwards, send me your email or, or your address. I'll send you a copy of it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. I, I guess I should give you your, like, uh, is there anything you're pitching? Anything that you have coming up that's a movie that you want out? I know you have Cult Hero that's kind of in release some places right Cult now. Cult Hero is, yeah, Cult Hero is just kind of wrapping up its festival run. And it did remarkably well. I do these sort of, like, uh, grindhouse comedies and slasher flicks up here and I just mm -hmm. love it. I mean, I love it. We get to make one or two a year and, you know, sometimes they're so, uh, they're, they're, they're great only to us and nobody else, but uh, that, uh, you know, I'm fine with that. And uh, sometimes, you know, you ban you hope that people are going to like them. Uh, Cult Hero's gotten really good response. People like it. It's a comedy. It's very broad. It's a bit of a kind of Sort of John Watersy in a way, sort okay. of a little bit like bad tasty. Uh, I think John Waters comedy, but uh, and and we're we've shot a two two other ones that are sort of in the can right now in post. Uh, one is called uh, the Hyperborean, and uh, it's it's a, kind of along the same lines. It's completely bananas, and the other one is called King of Kings, which is an absolute. I just can't wait for this thing to come out. And I, I think it will probably come out next year, fingers crossed. Uh, we've been working on, on that one for some years, actually. Okay. And shot it the month before uh, the pandemic. And so oh. it's got all of this sort of supercharged vibe, right? So anyway, I, I don't want to talk, tell, say too much about it because it's got all kinds of spoilerific thing. Hmm. Uh, to it, uh, and I'm working with the same fella working on um, uh, a kind of uh, a, a film about Henry Hudson, Henry Hudson's encounter with a, a fic, or a fictional. We make it up. Henry Hudson's encounter with uh, Samuel de Champlain in the Ottawa Valley in uh, 1612. So. It's <laughs> So that, I mean, and we've been researching that for years, too, and I think that's wow. going to be really interesting. Uh, also shooting another one in March with uh, my uh, nephew, Jake, whose last film did very well, actually. He's shot a few features, and he does it all on his own. And it it, it, it sold to up here of uh, Factory Films and was on, this, it got picked up by Cineplex Odeon's app, you know, so it, mm -hmm. it got out there and goes, well, well received. So this next one, is a, a very strange uh, uh, a story about a young woman in 1972 hitchhiking to a roller rink <laughs> and gets and takes a shortcut through the woods. Okay. And so the woods are sounds you know, sounds like that one's going to get a little scarier, more problems happening for the lady as she goes through yeah, all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So lots of things, you know, lots of cool. things. I, lo I love your writing. Thank you. Uh, can you give me like a little like brief on what the end body problem is? Uh, the end body problem. It's it's a book that I published about five years ago with a press that went under. Uh, it was a scandal, scandal, and uh, uh, they went under, uh, and and were chased out of town practically. <laughs> and so all of these these they published a lot of people, and uh -huh. and they were you know good books. And so a lot of these books sort of went turned into flotsam, right? And uh, an end body problem was one of them. And I haven't 
really hustled to get it back with another press, which I probably should do, and it wouldn't be that hard to do, but I, I have a hard time looking back and fixing things. I tend to go mm. forward. So I've got, but I've got on my top of my piano over there a dozen of a dozen copies. The last dozen copies is in existence. I, and so, wow. So I sort of give them away when I sort of feel like it. And uh, and and I, if you're reading those books, then you can have this one. Uh, it it will, you know, it's it won't be published again in this form, uh, but. Uh, the other book that went with it was a book called Cash Town Corners, which was also published in the same press, which I don't have any copies of, and I, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that's been optioned and uh, optioned by uh, uh, Craft House and George Mahalka and Susan Kern, who up here are, are well known. George Mahalka directed uh, the original My Bloody Valentine. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so he's, you know, they're, they're tr we're trying to get that that made, and and if we do, and I think we will manage to get it made, then the books will get easily published somewhere, uh, because they'll have a film to tie into, and it is a kind of a zombie novel, but it's not really, uh, because in this case the zombies, um, don't actually aren't actually dangerous at all. I mean, they just they just kind of don't people that don't die and twitch. Huh. And so they just lay down and they just twitch. And so it's this kind of horrible thing. And 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 people are sort of like completely it fucks people up because they don't know what to do with them. And it becomes a kind of a waste disposal problem almost. And they come up with a bunch of different things. They you burn them. Ah, we don't like that either. You you know, we don't like the optics of that. And we don't <laughs> like this. And do we bury them? No, because they just kind of wiggle back up to the top. And what are what are we gonna do? Do we grind them up? That's just awful. Right? So there's no <laughs> real palatable way to do it until yeah. uh this one company comes up with an idea to jettison in car in big cargo things jettison them into the upper atmosphere and release them into orbit around the earth <laughs> so they and you can so they're that's where they will be and they will be all our, our dead will be up above us um and and we you will get them and when your your loved one is sent you get a like a little card that shows you where in the night sky you can look for them Right? You won't actually be able to see them. But you'll be able to locate where they are. It's like right? Skylab, so like they're... like Uncle going past. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Uncle's going past. Uh, so, but the problem is in well, first of all, there's a great kind of psychological effect on people, and it causes a kind of global depression. People become very depressed because when you die now, you just go this far up. <laughs> <laughs> and and you you're you're still sort of animated in in it, it it's it just becomes way too much for people to sort of process and yeah. and it changes the way they think about living and dying and and everything right it becomes sort of a problematic and then but then once the the bodies start to collect in this orbit around the planet and there's so many of them they start affecting the sunlight <laughs> and they start affecting it so that there is this and the people don't really know but a thing starts happening which is a kind of aggressive hypochondria uh in, in which the illnesses will manifest themselves rapidly so that if you if it enters intrusively into your thoughts uh in the morning that you think you have uh uh you know ear cancer by two in the afternoon, you will you will be in stage four meta metastasized. You know what I mean. Uh -huh. And if you think this, so there's a kind of terror of thinking uh, because it's going it, it, this hypochondria, and they don't know really the source of it, but they think it's because of the light is not is altered. They think yeah. it's a purely psychological thing, maybe. And that so there's this so anyway so it, it sounds really cool I I love um I love surrealist body horror so it sounds pretty much right in line with the stuff that I'm gonna get a kick out of oh, so dude, yeah I'm really looking forward so, to it got so much of that in it and in fact the editor after she, the editor of the book 
she, she told the publisher after she'd finished working on it that she spent a week in bed with wine. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't handle it. It's oh, really, man. really extreme. Uh, and I wasn't able to, it wasn't like usually, the, you know, you'll get it at the UK or you'll sell it somewhere or uh -huh. something like that. But it, we got notes back from from international publishers saying this is too outre for us. We just can't. So that's the book that that exists, but won't exist for much longer. You see, you got your yeah, know, the, the body floating in space, yeah, the, yeah, uh, and it's all got all kinds of wacky things, and it's it's there's co codified language with a. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and the uh, the key to the code was published in this obscure uh, um, uh, mail mail in school correspondence school that's located in off right off Rice Lake near Butley. <laughs> so you guys so did. You, can't so you guys really, did like an ARG. <laughs> Yeah, you can't actually. There's parts of this that you can't know what I'm talking about because <laughs> you can't. That's pretty great. I I have made like puzzles in time. Like I did um, this is not porn.com way back in the day, and it's an ARG puzzle. Um, yeah. But it was stuff like that. Like you had to have the key to be able to translate the text so you could get to the next part of the challenge, yeah, and the next yeah. part of the puzzle, and all that yeah. stuff. I love that stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, I'll send this to you, man. Cool. And, uh, All right. I, I should get going. All right, cool. Uh, uh, thank you so cool. much for taking the time. This is awesome. Uh, I, uh, Great. I'm so happy that we got to chat. And uh, I just wanted to say totally. I love the movie and uh, love the books. And I look forward to what you got coming next. Well, thanks, brother. <laughs> cool. Thanks.